Okay, good afternoon and welcome to Podcasting the Sociological. This is the launch event for the Uncommon Sense podcast that we've just launched at the Sociological Review. Um, I am Professor Nicola Benson and I will be chairing today's events. I'm also the Chief Executive of the Sociological Review Foundation, a Professor in Public Sociology at Lancaster. For those of you who don't know me and my work, I work on migration and citizenship. Um, and in my spare time, I do also podcast. Um, I run a podcast called Who Do We Think We Are, which is all about questions of migration, race and belonging in Britain today. Um, but I'm here today in my capacity as the project lead for the Uncommon Sense podcast. And this is the podcast that we've launched that sees the world afresh through the eyes of sociologists and takes a sideways look at the everyday. Now, just a couple of things before we get going. Please do bear with us if there are any glitches or technical difficulties. Um, we have uh, people on the panel today from across the world. The time zones that are represented within the production team are quite something, and we'll probably come back to that later when we talk about some of the challenges around recording. Um, but we also know that not everybody's internet is as stable as it might be. So just, just bear with us if there are any issues there. So joining me today on the panel are members of the Uncommon Sense podcast production team. So first up, we've got Alice Block. Alice is our fantastic executive producer. And she's got some sociology in her academic background, but really she's been with us um, because of her training in broadcast journalism and her experience at the BBC working on ideas based programmes. Among these, the one that most of you will be familiar with is Thinking Aloud. I'm also joined by our hosts, Dr Rosie Hancock, who's at Notre Dame University in Australia. Um, and her research focuses on religion and politics. And our other host, Dr. Alexis Hugh Truong from the University of Ottawa in Canada. So you're already getting a sense of that time zone difference that we were talking about. He works on youth and mental health. And last, but by no means least, um, George Kalivis, who is our project officer for the podcast, but he's also a sociologist. He's currently a PhD candidate in visual sociology at Goldsmiths, where he's researching homemaking among the queer the Greek diaspora. In terms of the format, we're going to be chatting among ourselves for about 40 minutes, and then we'll hand over to you for some Q&A. And we're going to be covering a little bit about the impetus behind the podcast, our experiences along the way, and give you a sense of some of the hacks and tips that we might have if you're thinking about setting up your own podcast or, or thinking about next directions with one that you've already got. So I'm going to start by coming to Alice to ask her what excited her about taking on this podcast project. Hmm. Hi, Mikla. Um, hi, everyone. So, so yes, yeah, so Mikla, we met to talk about this back in 2019, I think, with Bev Skeggs. Uh, so it's a good while ago. And back then, I was still kind of just about working on programmes that get sociologists, thinkers, academics, writers, etc. on air, um, mainly at the BBC as an assistant producer, a producer. So things like Thinking Aloud, things like the Forum at the World Service. Um, and that was all great. And that's all good work. But I was excited by, by this really as a chance to do something new, I think, and to kind of develop a format actually collaboratively as well, which is unusual from scratch. Um, also, it was important to me to contribute something meaningful to the world, well, the Wild West kind of world of podcasts, really. A lot of which, if I'm honest, and I think people often aren't, is kind of about, you know, ego, PR, brands, clicks, etc. And I think it's fair to say that this project wasn't really about that. It wasn't about creating a kind of big mega hit for the sake of it, although that would be wonderful. Um, it's about, you know, making something that's of value to listeners who kind of want to draw on it, engage and engage with it properly. And it's also something that right from the start, we wanted to make really thoughtfully. Um, so just for me personally, it's been really great. And it is really great to work with a team that um, is intelligent, of course, that kind of takes ethical decisions, particularly about kind of language and framing, actually, really seriously. And that was the case right from the start. So in a previous role, you know, once, and I won't say where, um, I had to explain to a, 
a team kind of why say the word tribal violence wasn't really a great word, um, you know, like ethnic conflict, say, to use to describe the situation that we were covering in that particular show. I think the team for Uncommon Sense would just totally get that. I wouldn't have to explain that. Um, you know, likewise, in recording some programmes so far, some of which haven't yet been broadcast, you know, we've made it really clear why you shouldn't throw around the word criminals or migrant crisis um, or even migrant or crisis, you know, uncritically and without thought. Uh, why you should speak of racial, racialization without race, um, well, and not just race. And I, I think those, I think that's been really important to me. And actually, I think that ethos, that kind of ethic um, would, you know, serve some mainstream programs and podcasts and even BBC programs well actually I think it's a, an ethos that everyone should start to develop to start talking critically and properly um, and in a way that yeah is more ethical I think. That's really great Alice as a kind of an intro and definitely the idea behind the project was always that it would be collaborative so mm. although there's there's five people here today actually there's a whole working group that have been involved with this project right from the start um, that includes Roger Burrows, Lisa DiComitis, Kirstine Payton, Nicola Ingram, Karis Campion, and possibly some others that I've forgotten about. Um, but we'd certainly kind of come together to think about what this format might look like. Um, so, I mean, that's all the good stuff about why sociologists should podcast, really, or why the world needs sociologists to think about what podcasting is and isn't. But I, I think it's fair to say that, that there are some challenges that go along with that. And I wondered if you might like to reflect a little bit on the challenges that you've anticipated in making sociology accessible through podcasting. Mm. I mean, it's an obvious one um, and it's not just a challenge with sociology. It would be the same with say philosophy or, or political theory, but I'd say language really. Um, so making things accessible by not using terms like, you know, obviously ontology, epistemology, phenomenology, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, but also actually even terms like say practices um, or, you know, my particular nightmare would be embodiment um, or even enchantment, you know, it's about making things like that clear or ideally avoiding them if you can um, without sort of dumbing down, if you like. Um, I think there are kind of two solutions to this challenge and hopefully they're solutions that we've applied so far and that we continue to kind of apply as we learn as we go through this so one is like ideally don't do it don't use language that people don't understand if you can at all you know achieve that but I think if you do it's just really important to be reflexive and honest and just to say that you you don't really know but hey you're going to have a go anyway uh, we've just recorded a really great episode on security and in that we mentioned ontological security um, and that's Rosie's line and Rosie's really great at just saying hey this isn't really something I work with, but I'm going to have a go. And I think that's really great, you know, to not be disingenuous, obviously. Um, but I think it actually matters ethically. And it's something that isn't talked about enough, at least from my perspective. You know, I think it's really important we shatter the kind of myth of the, the super presenter, if you like. The super presenter who knows everything, who's got this kind of off the cuff kind of genius about them. Um, because actually, at least in my experience, you know, the, the presenter is pretty much always, you know, they work hard, sure, but they're briefed by a producer who might even have a researcher if you're in these big institutions. They might even have an intern, uh, you know, hanging around there, you know, making the coffee or whatever or helping. But it's really important to acknowledge all of that, because if you don't do that, you're kind of reproducing not only kind of unethical workplace dynamics, but also kind of damaging notions of, of intelligence and and competence. Um, so maybe that's strayed a little bit from your, your question, I guess, but um, I think, you know, yeah, this challenge of, of language, taking it seriously and kind of being honest about things we, we don't um, fully understand or that aren't our kind of comfort zones in order to bring listeners on board. Um, that's maybe been a challenge, but hopefully one we've, we've met and can meet. I think it's really important, Alice, those reflections on the kind of the propensity of, of, of a production actually reproducing precisely some of the um, inequalities that we might want to critique in the kind of the finished format of, mm. of a podcast in the content of it. So I think those, those reflections are really important um, alongside those kind of reflections on how we actually break down some of the things we take for granted that people understand in how we explain them in a podcast. So just a final question before I hand over, I turn over to Rosie and Alexis. 
Where did you turn to for inspiration in those early days? Because you've already identified that there are quite a lot of problems with some other podcasts or some other radio productions. Yeah, I guess I should talk about the, the good stuff as well. And, and there's a lot out there. And I think the others will also have their own examples. Um, I mean, gosh, it was a couple of years ago now that we sort of started workshopping this. And I sent some examples around to everyone. And everyone else shared their examples. Um, we did look at what there is in terms of sociology. So obviously there's the totally excellent surviving society, which I think is just so successful at communicating kind of with excitement um, how, how kind of important sociology and sociological thinking is. But actually, I think we were also interested in kind of getting the tone of things right. And that really mattered to everyone. So we wanted something that was a kind of approachable, conversational, considered welcoming free of ego as we've just been talking about very much banter free definitely um one thing I remember circulating and I know it's a big it's possibly Rosie's favorite podcast we'll see um is on being with Krista Tippett in the US and um, that's kind of like a sort of spiritual secular spiritual kind of conversation show where she talks really warmly and openly and kind of without judgment I think to public figures poets activists etc um, we wanted that kind of tone, I guess, in terms of um, creating a kind of comfortable and accessible atmosphere for people, a kind of culture, a space where people are saying yes and, and not yes but. So we didn't need to be needlessly kind of adversarial, catching people out. That wasn't what we're interested in here. You know, it's not a viver, you know, it's not, um, you know, PM or whatever. And actually, just, just finally, on, on a more recent thing I've been listening to, though it's been running for a long while, but I think it's also in that vein. It's possibly my favourite podcast at the moment, which is called This Jungian Life. And it's just three Jungian psychoanalysts based in the US. Again, having a conversation together. And it's very, you know, hey, I think what you said is really interesting. And can I add to that by elaborating a bit, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, just that's, I think that's the tone in which conversation needs to go, not just on podcasts, but I guess more kind of in public culture as well. So I think it's important that, that we achieve that too. There's a kind of sense of bringing people into the conversation uh, in this kind of intimate way. I think we talked about that before, how you create intimacy in a podcast mm -hmm. um, so that people feel that they're part of the conversation rather than listening in on it in some respects. Yeah. Yeah, yeah not, not to alienate people or to needlessly try to win points against people, I suppose. Yeah. That's really, really helpful, Lala. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of um, move on to talk with um, Alexis and Rosie now about about hosting the podcast. Now, Alexis and Rosie have been signed up to this project um, since right at the beginning when I sent out an email to um, all members of the Sociological Review editorial board and all of our trustees to find out who'd like to be involved in just thinking about what a podcast might look like. Um, so I'm going to ask, start by asking you, Alexis, what was it the, about the prospect of being involved with the podcast that got you excited? Well, if, if I go back, like, actually, I became part of, like, uh, I joined TSR in, uh, in 2016 as a postdoc at Goldsmiths. And at the time, I'm not sure if you remember, but we had explored the, uh, the idea of producing, like, small videos to capture uh, some of the research we were publishing uh, to make it more accessible to various audiences. And I really had enjoyed that experience, it gave me uh, actually a lot of desire to explore that in my own research uh, subsequently. Um, but when I heard that there was a podcast series potentially in the horizon, I was like, I am in. And then when I saw like all of the other colleagues that were becoming part of that, that smaller committee, uh, like Rosie, uh, that was interested. And also when I, I met Alice and got to learn more about her work, um, and, and like I was also, I am in. So like, a bit like after, right? A few meetings after when the question of like, who would co-host open? I was like, hmm, I've never, animated any like podcast before I don't have any experience uh, in that um, and I live all the way like in, in Quebec so there was like also like time questions um, but I, I felt it was really an opportunity to in a really quite like selfishly like uh, open up curiosity and just ask a bunch of questions to uh, really really like interesting uh, what I felt would be uh, interesting guests so at that time, I also wrote that email. I was like, hmm, count me in, <laughs> like, if you'll have me, right? Um, so, yeah, but uh, I think, like, of course, there's, there's like, a various, 
like challenges and stuff like that but uh, it's been really a, an amazing uh, experience up until now so I mean, the thing that really um, stands out to me about both you and Rosie, Alexis, is how enthusiastic you were about this project from day one. It was almost like exclamation mark emails, basically. Yes, count me in. <laughs> if, actually, if I can add something, like I feel that when I, I, I listen to the, the, the podcast and I feel like my family members are like, when you're talking, are you like always laughing? And it's, it's actually like, I have a huge smile and I'm, I'm always like so fascinated by, by what the guests are saying. So I'm actually like way up there in level of enthusiasm, maybe like I am right now. But anyways, it's a, yes, it's quite, it's quite a great experience. It's really nice that people can hear those expressions on your face when you're speaking. Um, I think that's a really important tip in some respects. Rosie, I, I mean, what really stood out to me, apart from your enthusiasm, was what an avid podcast listener you are. This is something that came across really clearly in those early, um, those early conversations that we were having, I think, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I was just wondering, um, what are you listening to at the moment and how has that informed your presenting style or your hosting style? Yeah, um, I mean, like Alice has foretold on being is sort of my... Um, one true love in the podcasting world, which I'm still listening to. Krista Tippett is an amazing presenter. And if I can become Krista Tippett when I grow up, I'll be very happy. <laughs> um, I just really love, I think, as Alice said, you know, it's a very warm, she's got very kind energy. Um, the podcast feels very positive. It invites people in. It's, it's got quite a reflective tone, which is really lovely. Actually, it's a very relaxing thing to listen to on the train on the way, way home from work after a stressful day. You feel, you know, emotionally or spiritually revived when you walk in your front door after listening to it, which I think is something to aspire to perhaps as a... <laughs> um, but the other podcast that I really um, enjoy at the moment is Ologies, which is a science podcast, and that um, has a, a really different tone. And they have guests in from all different branches of science and from very kind of interesting little niches. I think the last episode was on acoustic ecology. And what's great about that show is that um, the presenter is so enthusiastic and makes everything really fun and there are great stories they have kind of good chat and it's really not what you expect if, you know sometimes they the, the guests are experts in slugs and sea snails and yet somehow it's a really amusing and interesting show and the science behind it they actually really effectively and accessibly communicate some of the scientific expertise that the guests are bringing and I think it's they really kind of nail um, making you know quite complex um, specializations and, and theories and things fun and accessible yeah that's one of my favorites at the moment as well it's really fantastic um, and I completely agree with you about these kind of like niche topics that that are made listenable that are made audible and understandable to people um, but I suppose kind of moving on from that there are so many podcasts out there at the moment it really does seem to be having its media its moment as a medium but why do you think, Rosie, that the world needs a sociological podcast? Mm, yeah, I mean, so for me, sociology and reading about sociology, finding out about sociology for the first time was a bit of a revelation, to be honest. Um, and it really, and I promise I'm not actually kind of just copying the show notes that we have for, <laughs> for Uncommon Sense, but it really made me look at the world afresh through different eyes, you know, made me question taking for granted assumptions about the world. It really does do that. And that's such a wonderful thing to happen that I think it, you know, we should be making, trying to make sociology uh, accessible to people outside of studying at, at university or outside of professional associations. It's, it's just so great. And what's I mean, what's really exciting, I think, about this podcast is that it's still making me look at the world in, in, in new and interesting ways. I'm thinking about the very first episode that's been released on CARE with Bev Skeggs and thinking about CARE as not just an interpersonal or an immediately interpersonal dynamic, but actually um, something perhaps less direct where CARE is, is also 
part of the social policies that we enact and the social structures that we have and and just thinking about care through that di different lens was something I hadn't really done to be honest and and that was um really thought provoking and interesting for me personally. I'm going to turn this around um, to you Alexis and ask you the other side of that question which is what do you think that podcasting offers in terms of making sociology public? I thought just bounce back on, on like where Rosie and, and, and Alice were saying earlier, but definitely it's kind of propagating, I'm not sure it's a, a real word, propagating a sociological lens kind of in the everyday lives of the people that are listening, right? So I've been thinking about that question a lot recently. And since the podcast came out, like I had really interesting discussions with like family members, uh, my partner, uh, close friends, and so on that, that uh, and I can say with the utmost confidence that that these discussions are, are quite lively. They're interested in, in, in the, the, the questions that were being discussed in the podcast. They're kind of applying it to some of the things that they see around them. And like my mom reads my, <laughs> reads my articles, my thesis and, and so on. But I've, I've been told that sometimes it's quite a dry and such, right? So it's, uh, it's, I think that this, this format of the podcast is really kind of Opening up, opening up a space for reflection, for inquiry, for curiosity in a way that other uh, formats don't necessarily do, like let's say articles or, or news and, and so on. And, um, and, and both Alice and, and you, Michele, pointed to this question of like, we have the, 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 the episode on intimacy, right? And it's, there's really like, when I listened to podcasts, something that really kind of, um, um, made me want to listen more is this atmosphere of of warmth and kindness there's a there's a sense of like being right there with the other people discussing like in in the same room so there's a closeness even in the distance that space and time like there's a closeness to to to, to what's um being uh, discussed and i feel that that really gives us a, 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 the, 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 the a kind of desire to become part of the discussion more, right? To, to think more about it. And of course, like these different formats all have like their, their different uh, attributes, um, but yeah, definitely warmth, kindness, uh, openness, like the words that, that have already been said by, by Alice and Rosie uh, today. Um, but on the flip side, I think that also it, it, it kind of generates important questions on how because of this atmosphere, maybe it's it's easier also to spread maybe like disinformation, propaganda, and so on. So that's definitely a, a reflection to be had. Um, uh, so yeah. yeah, and I mean, and we know of, of some quite famous cases that are being discussed at the moment that, that do precisely talk about podcasting and its propensity for kind of disinformation and um, and propaganda, as well as fake news, of course. Um, but I really love that image, Alexis, of your mum like engaging with your podcast, um, whilst while while your thesis is probably just sitting on a shelf somewhere, if it's there, like collecting dust. So um, for her, anyway. Um, so so yeah, I think it does really offer um, the that possibility of of bringing you know people who we might be talking to in our everyday who might not be so involved in our sociological lives um into those conversations that we're having and showing them a little bit of what we do or, or quite a lot of what we do in a way a way that's tailored to to, to them um, i'm going to bring george in here because um george george does a huge amount of work behind the scenes but his role really is to make sure that the podcast makes its way into the world so i wanted to start george by asking you about why you wanted to get involved with the project um yeah i mean it's a great job to do overall i have to say and i also you know do that have to say that i course. have to say that yeah <laughs> <laughs> no but the reason why i think is um because you know i feel this this behind the scenes uh role kind of allows for the closest listening of the podcast possible and it's not so i'm saying this having in mind for instance when i'm doing the transcripts and I'm really going word by word and I focus so much on certain concepts. And then this also, I mean, my, I find myself very often uh, taking notes on the side for my own research <laughs> uh, while doing the transcripts, for example, but not only the, the audio itself, it's also the other 
uh, you know, material and assets, let's say, uh, that are there, like the nodes, the further readings. I think it's a very, it's a very interesting set of material to have and to have a close interaction with. And I think overall, it's it's what we've been talking about, like the, um, the idea of podcasting as a sociological device for disseminating research. But maybe we should, and but I think we can also think it as a device for either doing or you know finding out about research. And I'm saying this being in a very basic thinking aloud phase right now where I'm just, you know, consuming all the thinking aloud episodes in a row. So, but, but that's exactly it, I think. And it's, it's, yeah, and it's, I like it. <laughs> I like that idea of engaging podcasts in your own research practice. So kind of informing, you know, the kind of knowledge production. And it's something that I've been thinking about too, on the basis of, of the podcast that I ran about Brexit as well, as part of a big research project, how that informed um, the development of the analysis in lots of ways that was a space for that but um, I suppose um, you know you've also highlighted there George the kind of the the fact that you are probably the person apart from Alice of course who has to listen to this podcast more than anyone else um, and that's to do with making sure that we put together a set of resources around the podcast to make it as accessible as possible so we have those transcripts that you work on um that anyone can consult at any stage so it's not just about producing this very nice high quality audio production it's all the bits around the edge that we've put together and and put out there for people to access after the podcast um but i wonder george i mean you've talked a bit about the process and you've talked a bit about the learning that you're doing along that along the way but i wondered if there were any standout moments to you um, when you've been listening, like Eureka moments or anything like that? I mean, many, honestly, but maybe I should mention one now that's actually from your, from the episode that you are in, uh, Michaela, on home. And uh, at the end of the episode, you suggest um, Catherine Mannon's book, Fragile Monsters. And then you, bri and then you briefly discuss this myth of return. Um, uh, like so this I this dream uh, like migration dream of come, going back to a place of origin and how this is not really the case when you do that and then that the house is not a home necessarily and I think this is very interesting for me also in context of my uh, my own research which is about the diaspora so I, it really made me think a lot about you know how how we bring along the place of origin in the form of a home rather and then we make like the difference between home and house as well. And then this family lineages as part of what makes a home rather than the, the space necessarily, or only the space. Um, yeah, so I would pick that moment, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, I remember we recorded that on the hottest day in London last year. I think it was nearly 40 degrees and I was in the top of Warmington Tower at Goldsmiths packing up my office. Oh, wow. So I remember it very well. <laughs> but, um, um, but before we hand over to Q&A, um, I'm going to turn to, to the panel to ask for tips um, that, that, that they'd like to share with those joining us for this conversation who might be thinking about starting a podcast and have just got no idea about where to start. So Alice, um, I'm gonna, gonna come to you first as our executive producer. Um, like George, a lot of your work on Uncommon Sense is behind the scenes. We hear you occasionally on the episodes, um, but, but really you, you, are, you are the person really making, making this happen behind the scenes. Yeah. So I'm wondering what tips you've got to pass on to those thinking about starting out on this themselves. Um. I have been thinking about this and I have uh, kind of two overarching ones, um, possibly kind of seemingly contradictory. Um, but the first would be that it really doesn't have to be expensive. So actually, you know, marketing, etc., is super important. And actually a lot of podcasts apparently spend almost the majority of their budget on that. People spend a lot of money on kit, etc. But I think what really matters are your ideas, kind of also the integrity of your intention, I suppose, as well, and that you have actually got something to say. I was thinking this morning, it kind of reminds me sometimes of kids at school, um, at least my school, who kind of bought really expensive electric guitars, but they didn't really actually even seem to like music or know how to play them. Yeah, like you kind of need to know what, what you want to say, what your mission is, and you have to be sort of passionate um, about that overall. And I think that has to come before the kit, etc. cetera. Um, 
that said I think ideally you do want things to be well produced and of course I would say that because that's kind of my job um but you know it really shouldn't be that different from a radio program actually so just because it's a podcast it doesn't mean it can't be kind of or shouldn't be journalistically rigorous you know you still can't defame people you can't breach copyright you know just because you're a podcast um and I think you know actually if you can it's really good to have a producer you know I spoke earlier about kind of language and the the risk of that kind of getting too impenetrable too kind of out of control too kind of academic although I don't like to use academic as a derogatory term um but you know a producer will stop that from happening so I think people don't realize the the producer often at least in my case you know you you book the guest you have a conversation with them beforehand to find out what they're likely to say what their kind of strengths are you brief them on what you sort of want them to say what you don't want them to say any terms that you might want them to explain you do all of that off air um and I kind of say that the producer sort of I've come to realize this over the years sort of makes a fool out of themselves really so that the guests don't have to and so the presenters don't have to you do those awkward conversations off air before you record um, and then when you do record, things can go a lot more smoothly. And you could be the presenter and also producing your own show. Yeah. So you could, even if you're presenting, you could still have these like preparation kind of phases and phone calls with your guest. Um, and then the final thing to say is just, you know, when you have recorded it, do edit it. Um, a podcast, unless you're really lucky, you know, and there are some that sound great and off the cuff and that's fine, but you don't really just want to upload an unedited WAV or mp3 I, I, I think that's that's not optimal let's say they'd be my tips I think those are really great tips and I think they kind of highlight you know um, some roles that people might not be familiar with so people won't be familiar with what a producer actually does um, because it's not we don't have an equivalent really well maybe we do actually if we think about this as, as a you know if we were thinking about a journal article you'd have an editor a uh, journal editor um, but I suppose the other end of it, the editing side of things, which actually is really, really technical and quite difficult work, like, you know, cutting things out, is a bit like, you know, you, you shouldn't really, I say this as a former editor of the Sociological Review, submit a journal article that needs significant work on restructuring and grammar and kind of content um, from that point of view. So, so putting, putting a podcast out that hasn't been edited is a little bit like that. It's a little bit like the first draft let's put it that way so mm -hmm. so perhaps that's um that's 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 something worth thinking about so george um what, part of your role is as i said before about making sure that the podcast makes its way out into the world now i think that this is another side of podcasting that people might not be familiar with it's like what do you do with your podcast once you've got your finished beautiful audio content uh, do you just plunk it up on your website? I'm pretty certain that's not really what happens. Well, I know that's not really what happens. So what are your top tips, George, for um, about this kind of podcasting ecosystem to kind of ease people in? Um, so first of all, to also answer what you do to upload your podcast, uh, it, it relates to tips. So for instance, we use a platform called Bassprout that helps you link uh, your podcast to all the other uh, podcasting platforms out there. And so one of my tips is take your time in the beginning to learn how to use these platforms, right? To learn how to use these softwares. And also be aware that, I mean, have a time plan, but also be flexible enough, as we all know, uh, because especially in the start, uh, you'll need more time to begin your podcast than what you'll need afterwards. And that will include, um, you know, preparing all the assets that you wanna have with the podcast. Uh, so for instance, for Uncommon Sense, we have, as we said, like we have two sets of notes. Um, uh, we have uh, a, a downloadable PDF. We have social media assets. We have uh, different kinds of things that you can consider whether you want to have or not. So, Another tip here, I guess, would be be prepared, know what you want to have, and also be organized, keep clear and good records of things so that you can easily access, um, you know, your files. And then maybe also be prepared for the unexpected technical error that might be minor, but might occur, and then you'll have to deal with it. So also keep that in mind because things happen. <laughs> 
uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've had all of those experiences um, and haven't had George holding my hand to, to work through them on my own podcast. Um, so yeah, I think that the important thing to kind of highlight there is that the bare minimum, if you want people to listen to your podcast, you need to make sure that it makes its way onto those major podcasting platforms. And the only way of doing that is to put it onto one of these hosting platforms, which will then populate that. So, so yeah, and then there's obviously the slightly odd and difficult to navigate landscape of podcast marketing. But, but anyway, that's, that's all for another day. Um, Rosie and Alexis, you're both new to hosting, and that must have been a really, really steep learning curve. So, Rosie, I wondered, first of all, if I can come to you um, for any tips and thoughts. I was going to say on what not to do, but but maybe it's a what to do. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're uh, uh, experienced enough yet to do what to do. <laughs> Or perhaps, but I mean, also possibly we haven't made enough bad mistakes yet as well <laughs> to say what not to do. But um, I mean, I would say, you know, there's no such thing as being too prepared. So it, the first couple of episodes that we recorded, um, I was really nervous. You know, I think hosting a podcast is something completely different to what um I do in my day-to-day -day life that's for sure um and I, it was I was also I think the first one we recorded I was heavily pregnant and then the second one we we recorded I it was a very very early days of having a newborn baby and being tired and yes you kind of read through all the show notes but there were definitely times when I was sitting in the recording thinking I really wish I had like read over this one more time before we recorded or having the brain freeze where you're going what what am I going to say next what am I going to say next what am I going to say next and you know poor Alice sometimes has to jump in and be like it's okay do you want to take that one again <laughs> that remembering oh no we're not actually live I can start again <laughs> um yeah so I would say prepare 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 <laughs> and Alexis how about you um what tips tips from your from your experience sure how well it'll translate for other people but my first advice would be uh to listen well to alice's advice <laughs> basically no, i'm kidding but you said it's a steep it was a steep learning curve and it was but i feel that really like with alice and rosie it felt like a breeze in a sense like we're just climbing this huge mountain and alice is kind of giving us like yoda level uh advice all the time um but yeah and and i mean um there's there's technical concrete things like I think that there's like technical learning for example just on on having a getting the best sound that you can and at first I I think that I didn't really have the ears or and I don't think that I necessarily have them yeah but it's it's um Alice was really like pointing to certain things that I was like oh okay now now I can hear that better so there's really incremental like small um even in the very small details like that was uh, there's critical elements to that and also logistically there's something about having a, a good team in the sense that sometimes we were recording at 5 a.m here before our kids were, were waking up or at 11 <laughs> I feel uh, where Rosie is uh, after um, uh, the kids are, are, are asleep and so there's there's this this, this balancing right and um, these 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 things right Have, having families different time zones and so on in other contexts it would have completely limited our ability to participate and take part in there in in this even if we were enthusiastic about this but i think and maybe it's because of like the values at tsr and so on and the team and, and so on there's um there, there's something there's something about how people were working together and really made that possible and there are other questions about I was like super stressed in the beginning, like Rosie was saying, like uh, nervousness, confidence, and so on. And that kind of points to the episode with <laughs> the amazing Bev Skeggs um, about care, right? There's there's something about the team and surrounding yourself. And I'm not sure it's a really like a, a tip or anything, but incredibly lucky of having people around that are so kind, so flexible, so respectful of one another. That That is really, at least for me, was kind of a sort of a condition of possibility for this 
to happen and, and to really be comfortable. And every time, even if it's at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., to still feel enthusiastic coming in and, and doing that. So um, yeah, in the end, if you're working a lot with, with individuals, it's surrounding yourself with, with people that, that do um, care about um, one another. I think that's a really, really good reflection, Sarah Alexis. Um, and I particularly uh, like that kind of idea of care, given the, um, the discomfort that we put you in by making you record at five o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock at night. And of course that's possible because now we can record using these remote platforms. Although, as you've said, that, that also, you know, that's, that shouldn't be just completely celebrated. There, there are some other issues around that too. Now, Alice, a final question before we hand over to the audience. Um, not everyone has the financial support that we've had thanks to the sociological review. I mean, we've been really, really fortunate in being properly supported to do this financially, um, as well as, as having the staff um, who are also working behind the scenes to support us. Um, and, and I'll give a shout out to them at the end of, the, of, of this session. But are there any ha hacks that you'd recommend for anyone DIYing it or just wanting to give it a go? Yeah, I've, I've got a few from the different angles. So kind of producer, presenter, guest as well. But on the kind of producer front, just a very boring but important one is you can just use a smartphone um, if you have one. And I'm aware not everyone does, but you can just use a smartphone to record yourself locally. So you can connect via Zoom or whatever, Skype, if anyone uses that anymore. Um, and then, you know, you have your headphones on, talk to each other that way. But when you're recording your answers locally or say you're recording a little voice piece or whatever, just use a smartphone microphone, kind of hold it pretty much to your ear as if you're having a phone call because the mic is designed to be noise cancelling when you're having a phone call. Um, use a voice memo, record yourself. And that works really well for starters. You don't have to start with really expensive microphones. Likewise, um, software, there's a lot of free software or initially free software that you can use out there. Things like Reaper, although it's good to buy a license if you can. Um, presenters, there's tons of stuff I would say, but I think just pointing to what We've talked about so far i think it's important to try to create a sense of community so rather than kind of you out there and us over here um don't call people listeners um it sounds a bit old-fashioned use words like kind of we us our to bring people in and also that's especially important with the mission of this podcast yeah because we're talking about kind of our shared crises our predicaments and the whole point is that it's an us um so that's really important in our case and a couple of things read guests um from the presenter producer side, just be nice to your guests. It sounds really obvious, but it doesn't always happen, I think. I think, you know, it's it's entirely, well, it's just really important to manage expectations, to brief people properly, to tell them what they're in for, that it will be edited, when and where and how it will be published. Um, and I don't really see any reason for not being helpful and responsive to your guests. You know, they're they're not there to serve you. They're often sure they might be, you know, getting a little benefit out of it, like their book gets some airtime or promotion, but they're also often doing you a favor. I'm not speaking of this podcast, but just generally. So be nice to your guests and you'll get better audio. Um, if you are a guest, because I guess a lot of people who are listening to this might be um, future guests on this podcast or, or similar ones. Um, just a couple of final things. Don't read your answers. It doesn't sound it doesn't sound great. Um, and also get the most important thing you have to say in at the top of your answer, because everything after that might get cut. And um, kind of ironic, given that I've given quite a long answer here, but just remember that the, the kind of less you say, the greater proportion of that is likely to be included in the final edit. So I think people sometimes think if I say loads and loads and loads, then I can kind of control this. And it's actually the opposite. I think it's, you know, if you say not much, then when I come to edit it, I'm thinking, God, well, I've got to keep that because that's all they said. And that's sometimes not great. But actually, if you're the guest, that's the way of controlling how things work. And I'm pretty sure that's how politicians do their sound bites too. So I'm going to, yeah. I, I actually, that's a, that's a tip that I hadn't, that I think that you've told me before and I'd forgotten, but that's what I'm going to start telling the people who come onto my podcast now as well. So it's hard. I mean, I can't always <laughs> achieve it. So yeah, it, it's hard, but that's the aim. So thanks very much for that, Alice. I'm gonna, I've, I've got a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, and the first one's from, from Lakshmi um, and asking what our top tips are for audience building. Deadly stunned silence. 
Um, how do we get people to listen, I suppose, really is is the, the question here. And I should say again, um, we are in a we're in a very fortunate position in that we, you know, we're supported by the Sociological Review. This is the Sociological Review podcast or, or one of them. Um, and so we, we in some ways we, we already have um, people that we can communicate with who, who follow us for our other things. But but really, we were hoping to reach out a little beyond our regular audiences too and and to try and 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 get out in the world a bit so any any takers i'm liking the chin scratching that's going on here alice yes i can try um i mean again these things might sound obvious but i think you know you can do lots of promotion on social media um etc you can write to kind of likely friends of your podcast people who might be um it sounds cynical but people with a big twitter following say who might share it or promote it or people who, who have a lot of contact with students in our case who might want to listen to it um but i think it's also a case of just talking to like absolutely everyone you know about whatever it is you're making and not being shy about it like i've done that in the past with work and you know pieces i've written or whatever and regretted it i think you just have to tell people wherever you can about about the podcast and get people get people to rate it give it the little five stars in whatever app they use get people to subscribe um yeah that that would be it really from me it's, it sounds obvious but that's what i'd have to say it's a lot of additional work isn't it that goes into doing that but i think that mm -hmm. there are other things as well um you know communicating uh, this is another self-evident one communicating with your guests before the uh before the episode goes live so that they can promote it to their following as well. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's just building those things into your workflow a little bit, I think, too. Um, and yeah, really, really thinking about that and, and, and finding ways to encourage people to continue listening as well through the through the podcast. I, I think that's that works. Any other thoughts, George? May I also just bring up the, um, the the part of making a, a nice visual also. <laughs> and by nice visual, I mean like finding a visual identity. Maybe that's that's uh, something to point out here. And I know we've hired an amazing artist for our visual. And, uh, and, and then this gives us an identity that we then reproduce on social media on, wh on what we share for each episode. So I guess maybe that's another idea, like another way that, I don't know, another tip. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's right. We focused a lot on the audio side of things and the kind of textual side of it, but there's also the visual, the kind of brand identity of it um, that's really important there. Um, so we've got another question from Charlie, and, and the question from Charlie is about the frequency. Um, th there's also a, there's a related question that I'm going to throw in, which is the one at which is which day of the week do you <laughs> should you should you release your podcast, which seems to create all sorts of trouble in the podcasting community at large more generally. Um, so Alice, what are your thoughts on frequency? Because, because of course, you've, you've probably got more experience around this. Mm. I mean, I kind of, I guess previously I was working on kind of live and pre-recorded radio where I had no say over the frequency of what was, <laughs> what was happening. I think with this podcast, I think monthly makes sense. So we're not well, firstly, the workload means it kind of needs to be monthly, but actually we don't, we're not, we're not kind of, we're sort of loosely topical, but we're not looking to be kind of hyper responsive, reactive to the news agenda. That's not what we're about. Um, and if we were doing that, we'd have to have a kind of much looser kind of production process. Um, so actually something that's monthly and that's kind of steady and reliable and that's there and we're building a resource that people can draw on, you know, in a few years time and it will still be relevant um that works for us um obviously you have to be careful then not to do things like say oh just last week this or next week this you have to those temporal references you have to be careful with um we're in the edit so rosie often says in hours you know oh i should say we're recording on this day by the time it goes out who knows where we'll be <laughs> that's kind of where <laughs> i think we've used that line more than twice more than once um but yeah you have to watch for that but yeah monthly works for us that that's all i can say it's what works for you yeah i think it's also to do with the length of the episodes as well yeah. like a force producing one 40 minute episode a month is quite 
it's quite some doing really isn't it yeah if it's if it's kind of scripted and considered yeah if you if you're recording something newsy with a couple of journalists who run into a, a studio and give their kind of little little take on things it's a totally different um different practice but what we're trying to do is a bit more considered and thoughtful and it's kind of you know iterative as I guess you'd say yeah we've got back and forth with our guests too so we need to take it, that into account yeah and on the kind of those questions of frequency as well um if you if you have had the um at one stage I got really into like reading lots and lots of stuff around the kind of the science of frequency relating to podcast releases and things like that and you know you'll find somebody that will tell you that it's best to release a podcast on a Tuesday it's best to release it on a Friday um, I think that the best advice is um, especially if you want to keep people listening to your podcast is to just make sure that you're managing people's expectations just to use that phrase about how frequently it's going to come out is it going to come out every single day of the week you know or on the same day of the week repeatedly um so yeah so consistency I think is the story really more than necessarily there's a right and a wrong way of doing it um Ellen has asked a really interesting question here about the format now um, I think that this is really um, one that we've, we've got some strong feelings about because we did try some different things before we reached this format. So Rosie and Alexis will remember um, the previous versions of this as well as, as Alice will. Um, but what she wants to know is, um, you know, it seems that a lot of podcasts are built around this format of one guest speaker per episode. But is there a reason why it doesn't work well to have a theme per episode with lots of different guests coming in? Well, I can, <clears throat> I can just say a few words, and it's just like the, um, when we started with the working group, uh, we gave a lot of reflection on like what kind of uh, formats were out there and what kind of format we felt might be the best fit um, for this particular podcast. And in the first iterations, I guess with a more of a magazine type of, of format, there were, um, we had sound bites for, from more guests and I I feel of course it wasn't me that was doing like the editing work and, and so on and just the contacting and the research but I felt it exponentially kind of generated uh, more work so like really on the question of frequency like once a month I'm, I'm like I'm not even sure how how it's like if you're a single person or, or a few people like doing that that's like so much work so to add that level of challenge, I think is is quite um, is quite intense. So maybe there's something there about just uh, not being practical. But I, I guess like any format works. It's just to to do to just quantifying like the amount of work and, and planning that's um, linked to that. I guess. Alice, did you I, have I, some I thoughts? I just as scribbled. Well? I scribbled a couple of notes. Um, I mean, as Alexis kind of said, it's a bit what works for you, but I think if if you're looking to do kind of a theme and then lots of different guests, um, that kind of, I guess, is what you sort of, I mean, it depends whether you're featuring them in turn or whether you're having like a round table atmosphere. Um, a round table thing works really well in a studio, just in my experience. Um, but if you want to have lots of people involved, if you're using a platform like we do, like Zoom and then recording locally or Squadcast or Clean Feed or whatever they're called, that, that gets more complicated and you just have that awkwardness of Zoom, but in your recording, um, that gets a bit messy. Um, I think, you know, those things, again, they're easier to produce in a studio as well, because you can jump in the presenter's ear and say, hey, we're not going to use this or don't say this or we'll take that again at the end. On When we're using methods like this, like Zoom, you have to, you know, type things in chat and it gets messy if there are lots of people so that's just something to consider and um, I guess just finally going back to what Alexis says um, if you've got say a half hour show 40 minute show and you're featuring different voices in turn and you're making what we call packages or features or little voice pieces um, it all gets quite tight and I think just for me when I'm editing things like that and I, maybe I over worry about this but there's just a risk that those people you're featuring then become kind of characters or caricatures in your piece because you're having to really crunch down their words and it goes back to that thing of the less that's said the more you can in include and I think for us and the kind of spirit of how we're trying to do things that's been quite important to not overly 
boil things down. Yeah, it allows for more depth, actually, mm. um, to, to have that kind of sense of, um, to have that format, I think. Uh, and I, I think that that's, that's what's worked for us. And we did, we tried a few times. Um, we, we had lots of different people within the sociological review team listening to previous experiments in format, shall we say. Um, so this, this is the result of quite a lot of trial and error on our part, uh, which is one of the reasons that it took so long to come to see the light of day. Um, um, Rosie, did you have any any final thoughts on this on this issue of format? Um, I mean, it was just very. I think uh, it's so lovely with the one guest getting the time to really. I think, like Alice said, talk to them and explore their ideas, particularly in the in the what we're trying to achieve with this podcast, the magazine style, um, or like multiple guest formats can be quite fun in other types of podcasts perhaps when you're not wanting to go quite so deep into the kind of subject matter or explore complicated themes um, and then another and another just quick thing that I, I've noticed quite a few of the podcasts that I listen to that will have kind of multiple little features in one and I have a, a lot of them have been established for a really long time um, but they will and they will reuse segments so they'll be releasing podcasts this you know say once a week once a fortnight but they'll say you know we first aired this segment back in you know 2006 or something like that and and they just have this huge kind of back catalogue that they can draw on so actually probably they're not producing two you know two episodes a month or whatever it is that they're doing they can you know and so I think for us and it's I think our frequency and our guests uh We've got a good balance going on. Yeah, I'm just thinking about what the organisational uh, hell it might be, must be to, to keep control of what different segments you've got as well and to remember what you've done, which is always my problem. We've got two final questions um, and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. So um, Kathleen's asked um, about whether it's worth considering video as part of a podcast. Um, does it create additional challenges or advantages? Um, I think I'm going to say it creates additional challenges. And, and one of the reasons that we haven't done it, um, there are many reasons why we haven't done it, is partly because we are recording at five o'clock in the morning for Alexis and 11 o'clock at night for Rosie. Um, and as you can see today, we've been, we've also been housebound for a very long time, a lot of us. So, so these are kind of, it is, it's kind of insights into our homes. Um, but there is a big trend towards people video casting at the same time as podcasting. So we're aware of that, um, but it's not something we're planning to do any time in the future. Imagine if you had to video edit as well as audio edit. Um, that's just not something that we, we, we've come to that perhaps I'm, there's probably a bigger conversation out there. And there are lots of tips and advice on the Internet that you could also consult around issues relating to that. And the final question that we're going to take is a question from Charlie again about measuring success. Um, it seems the obvious answer uh, might be how many people listen, but do we have a target uh, to know when we're hitting our goals and have become successful? <laughs> um, oh, metrics again. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe, I'm, maybe I don't have a long vision for, for, for the podcast. For me, it's successful just every time you finish the recording, like after two hours of us being, I feel it successful. I, like, just the learning, the experience of, of, of talking with others. So that might be a bit naive on my part because yeah, there's no, but yeah, the, 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 the feeling of success, I feel I, I already uh, feel it every time I'm with, with, with my colleagues and it's, um, but uh, yeah, maybe it's not a great answer for, uh, for in terms of quantifying it. Well, I think that there is a question about whether it should be quantified and podcast statistics are notoriously problematic anyway, because you don't necessarily get listens, you get download figures, uh, or you did anyway. I mean, you know, I might be out of date on this, but I had a conversation very recently with Chantal Lewis at Surviving Society about metrics um, and kind of thinking about success and things like that. And I think what she said to me is really important, which is, you know, we're not we're not producing the news. OK, so this is like a first thing to say. So it's not about how um, immediately people listen to it. 
a lot of these things will be quite a long game. So we're producing content that we want people to listen to in, um, you know, in, in a year from now, you know, in months from now, in a year from now, a little bit like journal articles, as soon as it comes out, you know, it's not just, it's not really how many people have read this thing at this point in time, it's how it gets used and how it gets adopted. So it's a bit of a long game, really, I think, about the success of something like a podcast. Um, we know people are listening, that's nice, and it's good to know, um, but we're here for a long game, like the Sociological Review has always been, seeing as we've been here since 1908. Um, sorry, I just had to throw that in. Um, any final thoughts on success? No, no final thoughts on success. Well, I realise that it's now two minutes past two, which is is um, an hour exactly to the minute from which I opened this up. I just want to say some final thank yous because there are people behind the scenes that we haven't mentioned today. Um, our sound engineer, Dave Crackles, um, Joe Gardner, who produced a fantastic music for the podcast, um, the art, our artist, Erin Annika, who produced the artwork. But I should also say thank you to Karen Shook, who's our communications manager at the Sociological Review Senior Communications Officer. Um, and to Attila Zanto, who is the operations director at the Sociological Review, because, and actually, and Simon Yule as well, who's the website designer, because without all of these people, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Um, and so I wanted to say a big shout out and thank you to all of them, as well as the production team. And also a big thank you to all of you for coming along today. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And please do get in touch if you've got any more questions.